All right, this is Wyndham Graves with Art 131, and today I have Howard, Su uh, Howard Sutcliffe on to talk about textiles conservation. Um, if you would introduce yourself and give us just a little bit of your background, um, your education, and some of your, your work life and things like that, that would be fantastic. Sure. So my name is Howard Sutcliffe. Um, I run River Region Costume and Textile Conservation um, here in Montgomery. And um, also I have a studio um, up in Arleigh, Alabama, which is um, in the north of the state uh, between Birmingham and uh, Nashville. Um, so I started this business um, back in 2012. And um, prior to that, I was the uh, head of textile conservation at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Um, so um, if we go back to the beginning, um, obviously my accent is not from Alabama. I'm originally just a little from Manchester. I know it's it's you know it's a little hard to place now after 20 years over here. But um, <laughs> I'm uh, originally from Manchester in the UK, and um, I uh, started out on this on this whole journey. My undergraduate degree was in uh, constructed textile design. Um, which was uh, kind of weaving, knitting, kind of like, uh, you know, well, as the title suggests, constructing textiles rather than surface decoration and printing and things like that. So um, okay. I, I specialized in uh, tapestry weaving, which um, was, you know, completely, almost completely useless back in <laughs> 19, 1992. I mean, it would have been a whole lot more useful in 1592, but um, that's that's what I did. And um, so I specialized in tapestry weaving uh, with minors, photography and uh, felt making as well. Also really that's useful. Cool. Uh, but it, it really, um, part of the, the, the university system in the UK, um, and I went to uh, Duncan of Jordanstone College of Art, which is part of the University of Dundee up in the north of Scotland, um, a very small um, arts and crafts school. So there was uh, only eight people in my year. So it was, it was very small. Um, but part of the part of the university system is that they have uh, an honors program, and to do that, you have to um, kind of write a dissertation. And um, part of part of the course was kind of uh, there was a, a history of art component um, to the degree, and so um, I was looking at uh, really the state of um, tapestry manufacture mm -hmm. in um, in the UK, kind of like in the late nineties, and. Um, you know, really had to put that in context of the history of, of tapestry manufacture. And that got me interested in, you know, historical tapestry, which generally takes you to Hampton Court Palace, which is um, mm -hmm. one of the one of the very famous repositories of that kind of material. Um, and Hampton Court at that time was also home to uh, the big conservation labs for historic royal palaces and also home to the Textile Conservation Center, which was a big training program. So mm -hmm. after I finished my bachelor's degree, I then went to um, the TCC, Textile Conservation Center, as it uh, is, was known at that time, um, and uh, did a, a three years uh, master's program in textile conservation. And um, after I was the last year, I graduated in 1999. Um, I was the last year to graduate from the palace location. Um, mm -hmm. The program th then became part of um, the University of Winchester, and that lasted for about 10 years. And now the program is part of the University of Glasgow. Um, okay. So, uh, and then from, you know, once I, once I graduated, um, I had spent, uh, I did my two summer internships at the um, National Museums and Galleries uh, on Merseyside and um, was based in Liverpool. Most of the big uh, museums in that system are all in Liverpool. Um, and then I went to work for them for a year after that. Um, 
And then I uh, moved to Boston. So for some reason, I always wanted to work in the United States. Um, and so I, I got a Mellon internship um, at the American Textile History Museum up in Lowell in Massachusetts, which is north of Boston. And um, uh, kind of, you know, I, I was... I, no, I'm, I was in, I'm interested in that. Um, you said you always wanted to work in the United States. Was it that you wanted to be in the United States and you happened to find good work here? Or was there actually something different about the work here that you wanted to do? Um, I think it was um, really kind of like the, the, the way that museums work in the United States is quite different to... Um, the UK. In the UK, most museums are subject to or really get their funding from um, the government. Mm -hmm. And so that can be that can be pretty limited. Um, and so there, there always seem to be, uh, you know, more kind of like opportunities over here in terms mm -hmm. of what people were doing. Um, there's a, a, you know, a much greater tradition of philanthropy in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so it always just seemed to be kind of like a little bit more interesting and, you know, more glamorous, which, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not. Um, and then, uh, so it was, it was just kind of like a, a bee in my bonnet that I, that, you know, I just kind of like had it, had to act on. So, um, awesome. so yeah, I mean, it was, it was good. I was, you know, in my early twenties and I expected it to, you know, moving to Massachusetts and Boston to be like, you know, being in Dawson's Creek, but, um, it was not. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it was an interesting museum. It, um, it was, it was kind of like a regional lab based in a large museum about the history of weaving. Lowell is a huge, um, Lowell really was based, uh, it was built based um, on a lot of the, uh, uh, kind of like after the English model of cotton mills mm -hmm. um, and, you know, weaving mills, um, kind of, you know, the mass production of textiles that, you know, uh, really furthered the Industrial Revolution in the UK. And um, so, I mean, Lowell was not a particularly nice place um, to be, you know, in the, mm -hmm. in the late 18th early 19th centuries um but it is it is it was turned to you know it's a large national park now all of those uh large mills are part of the national park service and um so they had uh, this this independent museum um that also uh had a regional um conservation lab so we actually worked on numerous projects for different museums in the new england area and um they were they were having some issues, kind of like personnel issues, um, and so um, I I basically hightailed it out of there after twelve months and moved down to uh, Philadelphia um, to work at the the Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, and I did that for uh, for uh, three years. Well, that's and... definitely not a bad escape plan. No, definitely not. It was it was a lovely, lovely, um, lovely thing. Um, so yes, uh, moved down to Philadelphia, and I was hired principally to work on a large exhibition um, called "Shocking: The Art of Fashion," which was all about um, Elsa Scaparelli. And Scaparelli was a designer. She was a contemporary of Coco Chanel, and she. He worked predominantly in like the 1920s to mm -hmm. early 1940s. And um, she was a much more interesting designer than um, Chanel. She worked with uh, the artists at the time. So she did a lot of um, collaborations with, you know, Picasso and Salvador Dali. Um, people like uh, Alberto Giacometti made buttons for her. Oh, clothing cool. and you know jean cocteau you know designed um you know dresses for her and she was um quite the character um and i mean you know very very you know interesting things um 
And uh, so, yeah, it was uh, pretty much kind of a, a three year period of getting um, this collection ready for the exhibition that uh, was in Philadelphia first. And then it traveled over to Paris to the Musée de la Mode, um, which is part of the Union Centrale de Art Décoratif, uh, which is kind of like the decorative arts wing of the Louvre, um, mm -hmm. basically. So, um, so yeah, it was it was I had not really worked costume that much up until then. Um but it was uh it was it was a really interesting um period and certainly now uh costume is is kind of like one of my favorite things to work on. So cool. um, yeah, we'll definitely get into that. In a little bit. And uh so yeah, from from Philly, uh that was the the Philadelphia thing was a, a 3-year Mellon fellowship. Um and then I uh, actually went back to the UK for um, a little while. I worked for the National Trust, um, which uh, was their textile conservation studio was based in uh, Norfolk, which is in the east of, it, uh, of the UK. Uh -huh. And, um, and um, I... Uh, the team, I guess the team of textile conservatives, there was probably about 10 of us and we were assigned. So, I mean, the National Trust administers like over 150 historic houses and museums. And, and we were each assigned kind of like, you know, particular properties. And, and so uh, most of mine had large costume collections. So that kind of continued the costume theme. Um, and then during that time, I was back specifically really to um do another master's degree in museum management um okay. at, uh, at uh city university in london and um just to kind of uh give um kind of like an extra string to my bow i guess and it was also an additional qualification that i needed um yeah to kind of eventually get the green card over here so um so I did that, and so I was I was back in the UK for about eighteen months, um, and then um, at the end of that period, I came back uh, over here uh, to the Detroit Institute of Art, um, which at that time, um, I guess this is two thousand and six. Um, they were going through the museum had completely shut down, and they were refurbishing it from top to bottom from. Awesome you know the studs on out basically so i was brought back in for uh, the reinstallation and had to get all the textiles ready and um was bas basically there for uh, about 10 years and um uh kind of you know towards the end of that period i was able to go uh you know detroit had some very well publicized uh problems and issues yes. over the years and um after uh the recession in 2008 uh things really slowed down and a lot of curators um had left had moved on to other positions and i fortunately curators that i worked quite closely with and um so I was, you know, left kind of twiddling my thumbs for a little bit and uh, just was then really able to um, kind of go down to part time for um, a couple of years, uh, which then enabled me to start building the business up um, down here. And mm -hmm. uh, then in 2014, uh, kind of sold my place in Detroit and um, went into private practice uh, full time. And um, I still go back. I spend about eight weeks every year um, up in Detroit working there on track now. So that's cool. Yeah. And I think that's that's kind of like pretty much up to date. Yeah, so, that's a uh, that's a, quite the adventure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely been interesting. So. Well, awesome. That's that's a really that's a hell of a resume. Um, 
now I think that one thing that might be a problem for I know it's a problem for me and probably for a lot of people listening would be that um, what is textiles conservation? So, well, it's a very <laughs> good question. A sixty-four thousand dollars question. So, conservation in general. Uh, before we get into textile conservation, so. Um, Conservation basically concerns itself with the preservation of an object. And that object mm -hmm. can be a palace or it can be, you know, a postal stamp. I mean, um, and really um, conservation and I think people are more familiar with restoration, um, the mm -hmm. word restoration. They're, they're both ends of the preservation spectrum. And so... With restoration, you are looking to return an object to um, a particular point in time or, or, or really kind of like, and more often than not, it's, to, you know, to, to make it look like it did um, when it was new at the mm -hmm. point of manufacture. Um, conservation is much more concerned with preserving what is left and uh -huh. stabilizing it, making it safe, for you know storage and display conservation is also involved in all of those elements surrounding that so the environment that an object is kept in um pest management correct storage correct display um all of those things that are going to aid um the uh the object's life going forward um and within that there's you know it's not like you know we can't do things to make it look better there's there's lots of things that we can do uh, that you know blur those lines between conservation and restoration mm -hmm. but um that's that's mainly that's the main point and then also uh, another big difference between the two is that conservation is uh, uh, well one of the big kind of ethical considerations of conservation um, anything that we do to an object should really be reversible, or that should be the aim anyway. Oh, that's interesting. Um, which is not the case with restoration. Now, so, um, reversibility to me would also indicate that the the, the changes you've made um, are obvious. So somebody coming in later would be able to undo like, yes. simply by knowing where that happens. So. So when you're when you're going and doing that, is there some? This is kind of getting into the weeds really quickly, but is there some way that you like tell the future that hey, I put this in? Uh, there is. So uh, you know, a big part of the, the process is um, uh, documentation, and so um, you know, we're we're kind of like uh, photographing every stage uh -huh. of an object. Um, you know of the treatments and uh you know generally beforehand there will be kind of like a you know a condition report and then mm -hmm. we're, we're also then kind of like describing what we have done to the object um so that someone you know down the line materials techniques change all the time mm -hmm. so um you know someone you know, i mean and certainly this is very important in museums uh where objects kind of get treated you know numerous times over you mm -hmm. know long periods of time so that you know the, the conservator that comes after you will know what you have done um and you know this is you know certainly in detroit it was a to me where predecessors had just you know written kind of like a report that was like oh was washed and it's like well that doesn't really tell me anything yeah. you know <laughs> how did you do it what did you do it with you know what uh, you know all of this kind of stuff so providing as much information as possible is um you know it's is is really key and um and again that's not something necessarily that you know someone that restores something would do Okay, so that's something that, like, if I wanted uh, something restored, I could have that done, but it probably just wouldn't be done automatically. Um, that actually sounds a lot like it is in the regular art, in the rest of the art world, and in even things like cars, when they do conservations, yes. it's very specific, but restorations mm -hmm. are not. Um, exactly, yeah. exactly. That's cool. 
Um, so let's actually stay on the on the techniques for a little while. Um, you've said that what are the what are the basic techniques that you're going to go into a project with? Um, and yeah, let, let, let's just start there. Pick a project, just something common, and what what do you how do you even approach that thing? So, um, I mean, the way that it works now that I'm in private practice is that, um, you know, the client reaches out, they're like, I've got this project, I've got this thing, you know, you know whether it's uh, Can you just walk sampler. us through one example you've had recently? Um, so, right now, I am working on a small collection of Best Ben hats. Uh, for the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Mm -hmm. So if we if we use those as an example, um, so uh, these hats uh, were designed. Uh, Best Ben uh, was a, a, a label out of Chicago. Um, he a he was known as the Mad Hatter of Chicago <laughs> and created these very surrealist, you know, weird little you know fantasies. That are, that are hats. So I have three right now that um, one is basically a little top hat that is surrounded by a circus. So there's lots of very creepy clowns and um, <laughs> weird kind of like dancing zebras. And strangely for a circus, there's some pigs too. I mean, it's, hmm. it's, it's kind of like odd. And they're all made out of leather and, you know, painted wood and, you know, things like that. Um, so um, so basically the hat comes to me, I uh, do what is called kind of like a examination report. And so I am uh, writing a description. I'm looking at uh, documenting everything, the materials, what it, everything is made out of, um, how it's put together, what has been used to put together. A big, a big part of... Um, this project uh, with the hat is that there's been a systematic adhesive failure. So the, the, the leather animals were all kind of like stuck together and the adhesive failed. And so they're into pieces. Um, so I'm looking at that and then I write a condition report that then kind of lists all the things that are wrong with the objects. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you know, the adhesive is failing. Um, the zebra's head has fallen off. Clowns are a little bit, you know, squiffy and crushed and um you know this clown's parasol is broken and all this kind of stuff and then um yeah, before we move on from there um do you do you do any sort of like, like you said that, that the glue is failing but do you do do you add in any like notes on forensic analysis like uh did it fail because it was left out in the rain or did it fail because it was uh uv damaged or something like that or do you just flat out give a current condition report uh kind of i mean you can surmise i mean unless you're working i mean you know like, okay this is i mean the glue is kind of like it's yellow it's brittle i mean it's just old and it's okay. you know this is, this is what happens um but uh i mean i guess i wasn't sure know, how much of that report would go into um kind of it, any changes in the way it's kept in the future Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so, I mean, definitely, I mean, if you're working in kind of like a large art museum, most of the conservation departments will scientists on staff uh, purely to do that. And okay. um, I have to say it happens a lot more with um, objects and painting conservation. Um, pure, and, you know, it's it sounds terrible to say, I mean, purely because they're, they're much more high, high value, you mm -hmm. know, pieces. And so there's there's a greater interest in um, in getting to the bottom of things, um, and certainly you know in private practice it's like I mean you know, access to uh, you know, some of these people, so I can you know I can pull a favor and have Christina the the scientist in Detroit kind of like look at some, mm -hmm. but um, you know that in private practice people are sending you stuff to kind of make it look pretty again and you know get it back on their wall um that's kind of like the principal yeah you know objective and and most of what i've done you know in asking kind of you know christina for favors um 
is you know for my own interest and edification nice. you yeah. know i know i couldn't really you know like i don't care why they turn that color it's like just make it you know look nice yeah so um so it's it's, it's for my own interest that i do stuff like that um but um so after after kind of you know condition report i'll then do a treatment proposal uh, and there you know with the treatment proposal you're looking at, you know a certain number of, of things that are wrong with it so you you start with kind of like you know um dirt whether it's kind of particulate surface dirt is it ingrained what kind of dirt is it um, is it dirt that should be there or or is it dirt, you know, just bad storage over the years. Or Explain dirt, dirt kind of... that should be there. So dirt that should be there is generally what we call as evidence of use. Oh, and okay. so, oh, so if it's like a military um, uniform, then you would want to leave. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Well, you know, if you have kind of, I mean, obviously, you know, with the, you know, you have famous examples like um, the chair that Abraham Lincoln was shot in at theater that's in, uh, the collection of the of the Henry Ford. It's like, why well, you want to keep blood? So you don't want to clean that up and make it look. Yeah. Um, so, and and that's kind of really where the differences between institutions come in, and what's important to them. So, mm -hmm. um, certainly, you know, from a social history standpoint, you know, the fact that this has. Abraham Lincoln's bloodstains on it is much more important to them than the design of the chair, which yes. could be more important to, you know, a museum. Um, and also, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really big thing um, with uh, certainly kind of military artifacts mm -hmm. uh, and also non-Western um, objects. And so where you have kind of like, you know, masks from Africa that have been danced out in the field. Uh, you know, they have kind of uh, just, you know, general dirt on them from being used or, mm -hmm. you know, they, they have spiritual properties. Dirt has been made as a way of anointing the object with significance. Um, you know, you don't want to clean that off. So it sounds so, to a certain extent like a lot of the dirt that's allowed to stay is stuff that got in or on it before somebody decided this was going to be a museum object yes okay. yes and that's and that's the thing i mean you know, hardly any of these things were you know made with the the end intent of ending up in a museum. Yeah. So, um so i mean and that, the whole dirt thing is is just really interesting oh, yeah uh, that's fascinating uh i mean obviously I work on a lot of, you know, being in the South, I work on a lot of uh, artifacts and um, not so much. I really don't work on that much, but I do a lot of uniforms, um, mm -hmm. which um, I just find kind of endlessly fascinating. Really love how they're put together. And um, but generally when I clean those um, and when I clean, you know, the first step of cleaning is always vacuum cleaning. I'll we'll get to that, you know, in a, in a while. Um, but with that, I'm kind of like saving the dirt that can then be analyzed later on. Uh, a lot of time, forensic analysis is done of dirt because you can look at pollen types, seed types, mm -hmm. uh, soil types that will really kind of like uh, pinpoint, okay, this was worn on this particular battlefield. Um, oh, that's cool. Uh, which is which is really kind of interesting. And I also, you could use that to determine whether or not an object is authentic as well. Yes, I mean, well, I mean, you can. Uh, you know, I guess you could fake it if you really wanted to. A sneaky dealer that uh, can do that, but um, it's also done quite a bit with um, archaeological. Um, objects because mm -hmm. obviously there was there was a lot of you know, digs happening at the turn of the 19th and 20th century uh, end of the 19th early 20th century that you know, the documentation was not fantastic no. um, and so you know they did they weren't really recording where these things came from 
players, you know. So, so going back and looking at the dirt on the type of kind of uh, fluvial clays like that can, can really help to kind of like pinpoint where a lot of uh, textiles came from. Mm-hmm. So, it's really interesting. It's really interesting. Um, but anyway, dirt is always the first thing we look at. Mm-hmm. Then, then move on to kind of like things like creasing and wrinkles. It's like again, is this evidence of use, or has this just been you know screwed up and put it in a box for storage type of thing? Um, ah. And so, then kind so of it's like a, if a hat was misshapen from the shape of the person's head, that's okay. But if it's misshapen from being in a box sideways for fifty years, that's not okay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, I worked on uh, uh, Andrew Jackson's uh, top hat operation that was in the collection of the Tennessee State Museum, and um, it was albino beaver fur. Oh my god! Uh, a lovely thing, and you know, it still has the mourning band around it because it just died. Um, I mean, it's a very famous hat that's in a lot of paintings. Um, that I mean, you know, back in back in the 1960s, 70s, when no much better, uh, kids were allowed to try it on. Um, oh my God, really? And this, I mean, this was done all over. I mean, you know, everyone I met. So, yeah. To, uh, yeah, Diana Freeland used to wear, you know, dresses from the Costume Institute at the Met all the time. So <laughs> it, was, it was totally dumb. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, damage that, you know, the kids did. Yeah, it's like, you, we want to get rid of that. But, <laughs> but um, so, yeah, um, so after kind of like creasing and wrinkling, you're then looking at kind of like the structural stability of the object, holes, tears, things like that. What caused those? Um, and then... Um, Really, from there, you're looking at kind of, uh, mounting, display, kind of like, you know, what is what is kind of like the end purpose of the conservation. Mm-hmm. Um, so really, uh, that would be kind of like the last thing to be covered in the, in the treatment proposal. Um, now, in a museum, kind of like the time and cost isn't really a, a huge um, issue, but of practice, then, you know, I have to give kind of like a, a you know, audited time and uh, cost proposal for the client and yeah. um and then you know the process after that is they you know they, they look at that they either agree to it or decline it uh if if they agree then uh, the treatment kind of moves forward so awesome um well let's actually just keep walking through that if you don't mind um so I've given you something. I agree to your proposal. Um, what's what are what are your steps from this point on? So the first thing then is, uh, and you can of, go ahead and keep using those hats if you want, or if you want to switch to a different project, that's fine. Oh right, sure, we'll carry on with the hats. So um, the first thing is is really documenting uh, the treatment. Uh, well, the, the condition of the hat before treatment. Um, so photographing it, um, you know, overall shot, kind of focusing in on particular areas of damage. Um, and then, uh, you know, you kind of go down this for the treatment. So cleaning is uh, always going to be, you know, the first thing that you really do. Um, and so with the case of this hat, um, the core of the hat was actually uh, kind of like a patent vinyl material. Um, and, you know, an early-ish, you know, a 1960s-ish plastic. So it's a little bit tacky. Um, I can't imagine so it's easy to recover. It's not. It's not. Um, you know, I mean, people always always ask kind of like, what are the, and, you know, I'm sure we'll get into this later on, of like, what are the most difficult things, you know, to work on? And it's like, I'll happily take, you know, a 2,000-year-old mummy over you know, something that was made in the 1970s any day. Because <laughs> you know what you're dealing with, with, you know, old linen and bones. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So, yeah. Um, so I, I basically, uh, you know, vacuumed the hatch. You're using low powered vacuum suction with very, you know, small micro attachments, tiny little brushes that you kind of like go over the surface of the object and you're just gently, you know, brushing the dust off. Um, and then because, um, you know, the plastic was just a little bit, a little bit tacky, uh, just holding on to some of that dust, um, I basically went over the whole surface, um, basically swabbing it. So, you know, <laughs> kind of like with a, a Q-tip and just, you know, uh, stilled water, basically, um, just to kind of like help that, that surface layer off and regain the shine of the, of the vinyl. Um, and um, the obviously this hat had kind of like a top hat form. Um, mm. It was the crown was open, um, and then all the little figures are kind of like situated around the brim. Um, and so the uh, the kind of like stovepipe element of the top hat was a little bit deformed, and so um, again dealing with those creases and wrinkles, I made a little form um, out of archival foam. I traced the outline, cut it to shape out of the foam, covered it with a, uh, a slick non-archival material and made just kind of like a little mount that sits in there that helps to hold out the creases and um, will we'll just kind of like generally help storage of the hat going forward um okay so that so that object is not just for this process but it will actually go with the object going forward yes okay cool yeah yeah so this will help the um you know the owner kind of, you know just keep it keep it in the condition that it is now mm -hmm. once they get it back um so um once that had been done it, it also kind of you know just the mount kind of provided you know a uh, certain rigidity to the hat that then enabled me to start reshaping the figures and um getting those back into shape and it was really just a case of working my way around the hat gluing these little clowns and you know animals back together um basically um so now we talk, and, we talk a little bit about adhesives in class and um one thing that I'm imagining, and I, I mean, I do a lot of my work with all sorts of random uh, synthetic adhesives I can get my hands on, but um, uh, do you do you clean off the old stuff and do you replace it with the same thing or do you replace it with something updated or do you not clean off the original or do you attach it some other way? How do you how do you replace an adhesive like that? So I didn't remove the original. The I mean, the original kind of... Uh... I mean, it's up to a point, some of the original would have been, because it was kind of yellow and powdery, some of it would have been removed during surface cleaning. Um, but um, I was really looking for an adhesive, uh, thermoplastic, a uh, high tack that would kind of secure the leather um, quite quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, whenever we use adhesives, and certainly... Um, the case of this hat is slightly different um, because, you know, you know, yes, I'm definitely going to use adhesives for this. But um, generally in textile cultivation, using uh, adhesives to support a textile when that textile is in um, incredibly uh, poor shape. So when kind of, you know, a lot of the times we can we use stitching to stabilize things. Um, when we use an adhesive, um, it's generally on a kind of very fragile silk or, or, you know, something like that where stitching is going to cause damage. Um, I see. And then you're looking kind of like at various different properties. Of, well, I still want the textile to be, you know, flexible. That you know you're weighing up a number of different options um and there's two main types of adhesive that we use um well i guess there's kind of like three really um <laughs> so there's kind of like the thermoplastic adhesives uh, thermoplastic adhesive sounds a whole lot like hot glue to me 
kind of well kind of but it's more like i guess it's more like p more like a you know pva wood glue type of thing and we oh, use okay. very 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 pure um you know adhesives with no additives that are going to age well and we use them at very low concentration and generally uh, we'll we will use them um They'll be applied to kind of like a support substrate, like a, a crepeline or a, a very fine nylon. It will be, a, you know, um, you'll kind of paste out the adhesive and you'll use it at a concentration, 10% in water. You'll okay. apply it to the substrate wet and then it kind of like creates a film as it dries. And then you're kind of creating kind of like almost like a Band-Aid that you can then apply to the textile position it and then reactivate the adhesive use or heated spatula um uh. uh the other side of things is kind of like the cellulose adhesives that we use as like consistent uh for kind of like paint layers and painted textile things like that mm -hmm. wheat starch with asian textiles um and then there's kind of like more heavy duty uh adhesives that are kind of like a little bit more crystalline so i actually used one of those with this hat treatment um and it's a, an adhesive that's beaver 371 and it comes in little crystals that you then have to dissolve in a solvent in this case i used acid and i was using that as a validating layer the paints on the the clown's face like that um that's not used particularly often um, in textiles. Things like that are more common in object conservation. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, got off on the on the adhesive tangent there. Oh, I asked. Right. <laughs> that sometimes those little tangents are the most interesting parts. Yeah, exactly. But um, so yeah, I mean, with the hat, it was really just going around securing all the breaks in the leather. Some of them, you know, you could just stick right back together. Other times I had to add like a little uh, reinforcement. And with leather, we often use very, very fine uh, Japanese uh, tissue paper that you can kind of like paint to match um, the leather and just build that up as a reinforcing layer. Um, interesting. Yeah, and then um, after that, and I have to say, um, Around the, the brim of the hat, there was quite a wide gauge net, black cotton net that um, had some breaks in it. And um, I've seen this done before, but I've never actually done it where you can actually uh, coat a thread, a cotton thread with adhesive and then use that as like a little bridge um, to kind of uh, repair the breaks in the net. Mm. And uh, I actually did that for the first time with this hat and um, worked really well. So Great. I was like, oh. That's always yeah. nice when new things work. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so, and it, you know, it's always nice where there's kind of like, oh, okay, I'm try it this time. Learn a new technique and that's. Yeah. It's always nice, you know, I mean, you no know, project is going to be two projects the same. Yeah there's always going to be new stuff to learn which, which is uh, you know it just keeps things interesting yeah definitely that's really cool and then so so you've cleaned it you've stuck it back together where it needs to be stuck back together um do you do anything with the color of the surfaces like if something's faded do you fix that or is there a way to fix that um so fixing color is is really one of the the things that drives kind of most clients you know nutty when i tell them that there's really no way to do that um so obviously uh you know textiles are very susceptible to uv light and it really um uv can you know really do a number on uh on dyes and um mm -hmm. and, and just general kind of you know i mean dyes can also react to you know numerous things in the environment as well that can help to fade them um and people always assume that kind of like oh well natural dyes are much more stable than man-made dyes which is not the case at all um <laughs> but but certainly you know when when man-made dyes started to appear in like the mid 1850s um 
And that was really a free for all and people didn't really know what they were doing. So they, you know, they could be, you know, wildly unstable and, um, you know, change color completely. Um, so that's always the tough thing when it's like, well, yes, this, you know, your sampler is, is really badly faded and, you know, I can't just take a Sharpie and kind of, you know, color it in. Um, you know, there's there's no real, you know, ethical way of doing. I mean, it's kind of yes, I could, but I'm not going to because that's you know that's that's not an ethical thing to do. Um, I see. It is what it is. Um, the um, yeah, it's 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 just kind of a really a really difficult thing. Now um, there are you know some kind of techniques that you can use like using you know colored overlays um i've seen people and then certainly i've one of the first projects i worked on um at the philadelphia museum of art was a large um palampur which is kind of like an indian bedspread um uh -huh. and uh it was you know printed cotton um a lot of the design um was quite dark brown so it was uh the the dye stuff um had been mordanted with iron uh oh. which is very deleterious to your textiles and so you know you had these dark browns and black areas of the design that were just kind of like disintegrating and um we uh used kind of like a a very very fine nylon net as the uh, as an overlay substrate um so underneath the textile was a layer of cotton and um then you had the um the bedspread the palampur and then um, a layer of fine nylon net over the surface um now the cotton underneath had been um traced out with the design of the palampur and the missing areas of the palampur had been painted in using archival uh fabric paints and they've been heat set and washed and they were good to go and then on the surface um on the uh, on the overlay the nylon net um the design had been uh, painted on with uh, various dyes and then steam set so you're then using kind of like the underlay and the overlay to help infill um you know those missing areas and the um the nylon net also on the surface with its with the the colored areas are helping to kind of um you know augment the color a little bit that has been lost um due to fading okay that's cool so there's there's little things that you can do but you know overall it's like no you know it's it's dyes are kind of like a you know dyes and fading are a, you know, a really difficult thing to um thing to deal with the same with staining as well and it's um you know, that can be, you know, very, very difficult to reverse. I mean, yeah. there's, you know, numerous factors with that, that, um, I think everybody can tell from their normal day to day lives that reversing staining is not yeah. the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> no, no, it's like, and you know, especially it's like, well, this stain's been there for 150 years at this point. So no, I think it's, and, um, you know, it's, I was, um, brought a dress, uh, years ago um to look at um and it was uh carolyn Bissett kennedy's wedding dress um she was obviously married to jfk jr and mm -hmm. um her sister brought the dress in uh for me to look at um the designer um narcisco rodriguez wanted it back for um his archive and um you know uh it was uh, it, you know she had it had been in storage for a long time. It, it had allegedly been cleaned after the wedding, <laughs> but um, uh, basically, you know, it, it, the dress had had a hard day, lots of champagne got spilt on it. And um, over time, you know, I mean, champagne is kind of, you know, pretty clear. And so it's like, oh, that's not a problem. Over time, those stains had oxidized to orange. And oh, so, no. 
when I saw the dress, you know, 20, you know, 25 years later, um, it was, it was, it looked like, you know, leopard print. I mean, it was just kind of, you know, uh, ivory silk with giant orange blotches all over it. And it's oh, like, God. well, <laughs> at this point, there's nothing you can do. So, <laughs> so, so yeah. that really, there was just nothing. You had to kind of leave it as is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, again, um, it's, it, it's just happened. Those, those stains kind of cross link with the, you know, with the fibers. And yeah. at some point that, that becomes a point where they're not reversible. Um, or you can reverse them to a point, but there's still going to be, um, yeah, you sure. know, damage and, and, you know, and at some point, you know, you get to a point of like, well, um, would you prefer a stain or a hole where that is? So, yeah. It's, yeah, so that can be tricky. Well, for everybody at home, white wine is not stain free. It's just stain free for a while. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, give, it, give it 50 years and it'll apparently be bright <laughs> orange. <laughs> That's crazy. That's so insane. Um, so when you have a project, there's projects that it sounds like you just turn down immediately. What really defines a successful conservation? Like when, when you just ticked all the boxes in your head, what are those boxes? Um, I think kind of just kind of like when it's, Super, you know, the difference between before and after is kind of, you know, really noticeable. Um, that's always, you know, really satisfying. Yeah, I mean, with, the, you know, with the hat, when you've kind of like tried something new and it's worked out great, it's like, okay, well, I can, you know, use this again in the future. Um, and, you know, when it's kind of, it's always, uh, you know, and, that's always nice to get the validation of the owner as well of like, wow, I, you know, I can really tell, you know, the difference with this and yeah. this is great. So I think it's, yeah, it's that transformation um, that obviously not only you can see, cause you're the one kind of like working on it over, you know, or, you know, a weeks long period or whatever, but when it's, you know, when the owner can definitely tell too, um, that's, that's kind of like the nice thing. That's awesome. Yeah. Now on the, of course, on the other end of that, uh, you, there, there's something that, that you said that, that you just turned down outright, but are there times where you get to the middle of a project and you realize that something has gone just either gone disaster, disastrously wrong or was disastrously wrong to start with and you didn't notice or a process uh, didn't work out or, or, or yeah. you at this point pretty much good enough where you can nail it? starting out um it depends it depends there's still kind of like um there's, there's still stuff that can you know creep up on you and it's like oh crap yeah. um <laughs> wish i hadn't done that but um there's 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 kind of like uh there's a few um one of the main ones and you know they're always really interesting you know learning processes as well um but with the uh going back to philadelphia and the scaparelli exhibition that i worked on mm -hmm. um a lot of the a lot of the um certainly the jackets that she made and coats um she lined with a particular type of silk called uh, silk charmeuse and it's kind of like a slight crepe um type of fabric and um they uh Silk, you know, can often be quite problematic because of the way that it's processed. And so um, when you start out with, um, you know, you have your little, your little silkworm that <laughs> builds, right. its, builds its cocoon around itself out of the silk fiber. Um, basically, the process is that the, the cocoons with the worm inside are boiled um, and the boiling releases um, the gum that mm. holds the silk thread together. And um, that uh, then enables the fiber to be kind of like, you know, 
released and you know wound up for uh, for future use and um but silk was always sold by weight and so um when the uh, the gum was removed um that reduced you know the amount of weight of silk and uh-huh. so dealers um and this you know goes back many 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 centuries would then soak the silk threads in heavy metal solutions oh, so God. things like tin and chromium oh, things no. like that that would then add the weight back but also were then you know very deleterious to the silk threads um also super toxic in some cases oh completely completely yeah oh, um my God. And so um, with the Scaparelli silks, they were weighted. So they had, you know, um, tin weighting in them. Um, And with that, you start to get kind of, um, you know, accelerated acid hydrolysis of the fibers and they start to break apart and it looks like shattered glass. And so we call it kind of like uh, shattered, um, shattered silk. That sounds and, um, super cool, but I doubt it actually is in reality. I know. It's kind of like a nightmare to deal with. And, you know, you really can't kind of stitch it all that well. And so then you start to use, that's when you start to use kind of like adhesives for support. Mm-hmm. And so for a lot of these uh, coats and jackets, we did kind of, you know, full adhesive supports using kind of, you know, silk repelene nylon net as the support fabric. And um, for the first exhibition in Philadelphia, they held up really, really well. And then um, everything was shipped to Paris and we dressed the show there. And then by the end of that exhibition, um, the uh, support treatments were starting to fail and the adhesive um, nets, the support fabrics Mm -hmm. were kind of like peeling off which they shouldn't be doing. And there was kind of, um, it was really perplexing. We didn't really know what was going on. And so we started to look more closely once all of these objects got back to Philadelphia. um, We did much more analysis on that silk that she had used. And um, it actually turned out that um, another step of the process was that after they'd been weighted in tin, they had been soaked in a silicon solution. And so they had almost, it was almost kind of, you know, like a, it had made the silk kind of like a Teflon material. And so yeah, that's crazy. it was completely natural that eventually the adhesive just wouldn't stick to it and it would fall off. So um, we then had to kind of like come up with, you know, a, a completely new way of, you know, supporting, um, well, someone else did because I'd left by that point. But um, <laughs> <laughs> the treatments that then happened, you know, I had to take that into account and were, were completely different. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's always interesting. Um, and then I had another project that I think of, and this was purely for the materials and because I didn't know really what was going on, was that mm-hmm. I worked on... Um, a Masonic apron uh, for a private client up in Chicago. And um, it was Ezra Cornell's uh, Masonic apron, the founder of uh, Cornell University. And um, so she sent me this apron and also this little certificate that um, he would have used to, um, as he was traveling around to get into, you know, um, different Masonic lodges around the country. Mm-hmm. And um, to me, it looked, you know, it looked just like paper. Um, so I treated the um, the apron, no problem. It was, you know, it was all silk, whatever. Um, and then I just kind of, I had talked to um, a friend who was a paper conservator and she told me, you know, oh, just kind of, you know, hinge it, uh, stick it to some card using little, you know, Japanese tissue paper hinges and it'll be fine. And so um, mounted it all, had it framed here in Montgomery at Stonehenge and it was, you know, great, send it back up to Chicago and And then after a few months in Chicago, she noticed that um, all of the paper hinges had um, kind of torn and the the um, certificate had uh, kind of contracted. 
Mm-hmm. And it's like, huh, weird. And, you know, she's a, a very particular client. And um, so she's like, I can't have so. She sent it back. And um, I redid it and um, talked to my paper conservative friend was again. And she was like, well, it, was, it turned out to be parchment. Okay. So it was like, ugh. And <laughs> while the, she was like, yeah, that sounds like parchment. That's just the worst stuff to treat because it just, it's so susceptible to its environment. Um, yeah. You know, it's just going to do what it wants to do. So um, anyway, I, you know, redid it. And, you know, after another couple of months, it just completely failed again. And so um, I was like, okay, um, I was heading up to um, Detroit for one of my stints at the museum. And um, so I had her send it to Detroit. And I was like, well, you know, the environment's going to be a little bit closer between Detroit and Chicago than it is between Chicago and Montgomery. Um, But I I then kind of um, treated it like a textile. And so I was like, well, clearly the hinging thing is not going to work. And so um, I basically made kind of like a little uh, fabric covered padded board, placed the uh, certificate on it, and then covered the whole thing with a really tight, um, fine nylon net. So it was kind of like encapsulated in there. And then it's like, well, if it's going to move, it can do. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's the same color as the the background fabric, so you're not going to notice it that much. Um, and it was, it has been completely fine after that. So it's uh, been much happier. So again, you know, a learning experience, but it's like, oh, yeah. ugh, you know, you, it's, there was a lot of FedEx fees of getting it back and forth, kind of. Oh, yeah, I can figure, imagine. <laughs> figuring that one out. So, um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you know, stuff does go wrong, but you you generally learn from it. So that's that's always a good thing. So, yeah. well, while we're on this and, and things going wrong, um, let's go ahead and talk about uh, what are the threats to textiles. Like, let's say I have um, let, let let let's let's talk about it not from the museum perspective first. Let's talk about it from the personal perspective. Let's say I have a quilt my grandmother made back mm-hmm. in the. 50s or 60s or whatever or or my great grandmother made back in the great depression um what are the biggest threats to that textile so i think well i mean i I don't think it really matters whether it's a museum or you know a textile in the home um the uh, the big threats are light obviously we talked a little bit about that with kind of like dye fading and then also um you know, under UV light, you'll you'll get kind of like uh, hydrolysis, acid hydrolysis of the fibers that causes them to become, you know, embrittled and, you know, basically start to break down. Mm-hmm. So light is one of the main things. Um, obviously, you have your, your two, you know, threats of water and fire. Um, yes. Neither of those are good. Um, what about just then... humidity in general? I mean submerging is of course probably not a good idea but like montgomery is super humid is that it is it is it's not i mean kind of mold is always a threat the humidity Um, itself is not not so much kind of for textiles it's much less um important than you know uh than you know veneered woods and things like that um so textiles have kind of like a much greater kind of you know moisture regain they can go from you know they can expand and contract a lot better than a lot of other different types of material types. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, you know, uh, mold is is an issue. And, you know, specific, especially if a, uh, a textile is dirty, if it has, you know, old food stuff on it, then, um, you know, mold can be an issue. Um, now, does mold, and the mold just make it gross or does the mold actually like eat the fabric well i mean it, it can kind of like eat the fabric and it can also stain it as well oh, okay i mean those little those little black fruiting bodies you know i mean it's yeah it's it, it can be pretty nasty um and then the other big thing is uh insects 
insects are a huge issue, both in the home and in museums. Um, and particularly, um, you have your two main types, clothes moths and then carpet beetles. Um, and they p particularly will go for protein fibers. So wool, particularly silk, secondarily, but they'll eat through anything to get to wool. So oh, that's interesting. That's, that's always that's always a problem. And then, you know, certainly um, a bit. Well, you know, wool, feathers, skin, hide, you know, whatever. They'll they'll eat that and just kind of relish it. Um, well, and like also cotton and stuff like that. They're not so interested in. Well, uh, not so much, but they'll definitely eat through cotton to get to wool. And also um, if so one of the neighbors here had kind of uh, called me a few years ago and um, she had a, a, a screen that she had bought in Korea in like the 1950s and um, the, uh, the fabric was actually cotton, but it had been applied to the wood using uh, an animal hide adhesive. Oh, and no. so the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the carpet beetles had gone after the adhesive. Um, oh, that's crazy. So yeah, it's. I mean, they they can be specific, but also not specific as well. They'll just kind of. So I don't know if this is a dumb question, but if you had like a mixed fabric that was like fifty percent wool and fifty percent cotton, I don't know if anybody actually mm -hmm. says that. Will they actually just go through and eat all the wool out of it? Yes, that's yes. crazy. Oh, bizarre. I had a project um, last year from Shiloh National Battlefield, um, the Whitfield coat, which was a very important Civil War coat, mm -hmm. and. Um, the the warp was cotton and the weft was wool and the warp was uh you know just unbleached cotton so you know quite bright white cream color and for and those of us who have yeah. no idea what we're doing in this conversation what is the warp and weft so the warp and weft with a woven textile uh the warp is basically the structural element so the warp is um the the threads that are kind of like uh attached to the loom Okay. And uh, when you see kind of like, you know, the threads going up and down, um, that's the warp. And oh, then okay. horizontally, what goes between the warp threads is then the weft. Okay, um, okay. So in the case of this coat, the warp was cotton and the weft was like a dark, bra dark gray wool. Mm -hmm. And um, so huge areas of the wool had just been eaten away, relieved, you know, just... Uh, um, and all that was left was kind of the um, the cotton warp, uh, warp threads, mm -hmm. and so there was uh, there was a lot of you know discussion as to how to deal with that, and um, you know how to explain that to the visitor whether they would understand what was going on, and um, so it was it was an interesting project, and um, I think that's awesome. That's crazy. But yeah, they'll just they'll just kind of they'll just eat the wool around the cotton. Um, conversely, you have you have other insects like silverfish that will just eat cellulosic um, uh, materials, so they'll eat paper and cotton. Um, and then weirdly, um, down here because they're a problem, termites. And I've only ever had uh, one project I did. Um, in New Orleans at the New Orleans Museum of Art was um, they bought back in 2014 they bought an entire um, Civil War era um, parlor from a house um, up the river road kind of uh, in St. Francisville uh, Louisiana I was just trying to think where it was St. Francisville which is kind of up to kind of like Angola and Natchez that kind so of you area. mean like so, a parlor like a living room like they bought everything yes the, everything in it so this parlor had been um, basically the the Harriet uh, Matthew Flowers who was the the Chatelaine of the house at the time um, she bought it all and it, you know various elements came from the uk and you know it was like the carpet 10 pieces of upholst upholstered furniture curtains all of the you know kind of like big pieces of furniture tajer things like that and it had all arrived and she put it together literally six days before the civil war started and um good timing 
Exactly, exactly. And um, so basically the house was shut up and, um, you know, the, uh, the estate kind of like remained intact after the Civil War, but eventually, um, you know, they, they opened the house as, as, as a bed and breakfast. And this room was basically just kind of closed off and um so preserved in aspect really um i mean it was filthy but in amazing condition really and so yeah, that sounds incredible just as a find it's like the bar yeah. find cars so uh, exactly just kind of you know how you find you know, like you know old ferraris in a barn or whatever yep. um so uh the current owner um and you know was getting into her 80s and she was like well i don't want to run this place anymore so she was getting ready to hand it over to um i think her grandson and he had like little kids and so they were like we need to get this stuff out of here because yeah. the kids are going to trash it and um so, and so no recognizing noma that. ended up buying it and um uh and so everything was transported to the museum and then i i spent 15 weeks in new orleans kind of working on it kind of cleaning it getting it up to speed um but the carpet was just giant i mean you know 30 feet by you know 40 feet something like oh that God. and it had always been rolled up and it's like it was the last thing that i worked on and um so we rolled Wait, it out so it made the five... intervening 150 years in a roll no, no, it oh, had been, it was actually, it had actually, you know, always been down on the floor at the house, okay, okay. Um, nailed in place. And then they, they, you know, took it up for transport. And um, so whenever I saw it at the museum, it had always been rolled up. And, um, uh, and so they had, they had a big show in 2015, um, Louisiana parlor. It was a big special exhibition um, based around the parlor. And so, the carpet was really one of the last things that I worked on and um, we unrolled it from the fireplace end, which was fine. Um, cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. And then at the other end, um, it had been, and I'd never seen this before, it had been completely eaten by termites. And there was also spots kind of like within the main body of the carpet. And it was really interesting because they had only gone for the the cellulosic parts of the, the the carpet was again created from you know cotton warp wool pile and so you had areas of the carpet where they'd eaten the cellulosic backing off of it and the wool pile was basically intact on the surface but it was just held together by you know goodwill and friction i mean oh my god so these parts could have just kind of like fallen out of the carpet at any particular time. I mean, it was amazing. Um, and then the entire uh, far end had just been chewed and they'd started almost kind of like nesting. So there was Ew. kind of like big, big globs of solid, just kind of like chewed up wood fiber stuck to the carpet that we had to just kind of break apart and pull off. It's gross. It's so gross. were you able to recover most of that or did that, most of that just dissolve in the cleaning uh kind of like I mean, a good amount of it and then you know it was just kind of like backed with linen and you know covered with covered with net just to kind of hold it in place um but yeah it was really interesting and a lot of people i presented um that whole project at a conference in mexico city a few years ago and um it was it was really interesting i mean a, a very few people had kind of like encountered termite damage before on textiles so it was you know very fascinating for people to see so yeah, that's crazy i had never yeah. heard that termites will eat, cotton, will eat cotton yeah yeah so no it was interesting to see all right so we have lights bad humidity is not great uh water is definitely a no-no fire is definitely a no-no insects are bad stuff is there anything else or does that does that cover that's or... kind of i mean you know you have just kind of like mechanical damage um the mechanical damage would be like walking on it friction yeah like okay. yeah you know just kind of you know now does hanging do that kind of damage as well does is there like a certain way that big things like that are supposed to be 
laid out or hung to be safest? Um, I mean, certainly with costume, kind of, you know, if you have like a very heavy uh, piece of costume and you're hanging it from the shoulders that are very fragile, um, oh, yeah. that'll absolutely, you know, do a lot of damage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so if I have like a big, qu again, going back to the grandma's quilt thing, I don't want to like hang that on two pins on the wall, right? Uh, no, kind of like for big flat textiles like that, we generally hang them using Velcro. Um, really? Yeah, so anything, <laughs> you know, I mean, all of, you know, you go to, I'm um, going back to Hampton Court, you go to Hampton Court, you see those kind of like giant tapestries from Henry VIII. They're all hung using Velcro. So that's hilarious. I don't know why that's something so funny that can to weigh, me. I mean, it's amazing. You know, you have this, you know, 600 pound tapestry that's just hanging from a two inch strip of Velcro. But, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, now, when it, we're still talking about, kind of about the threats to all this stuff, what's just the strangest condition you've ever had something come into you for? Like, other than I, termites, I guess. Um, Jeez. Yeah, it tends to be, again, going back to that whole 1970s thing. Um, I did a, uh, a quick survey at the Motown Museum up in Detroit. Um, probably a couple of summers ago now and I was looking, I was just helping them with a grant um, application to get some costumes worked on. And um, we were going through stuff and then they pulled out this box and it just looks like, you know, there was a dead iguana inside of it. And it's like, what the hell is this? And it was um, <laughs> two pairs of boots that I don't know what happened to the third one because these belong to the Supremes, but they were thigh length boots that were kind of like a, a you know some sort of vinyl material that were then covered with kind of like a net that had like glitter over it oh my god and the whole thing had just been packed away like this just kind of screwed up in this kind of like small you know banker's box and you could just lift everything out as a block basically though it's like oh god nope there's nothing that can be done for these i mean they were just so crispy and solid um it was you know just just kind of like really awful so it, it does tend to be you know those modern materials that are really kind of you know problematic yeah so the synthetics i guess are what's yeah the issues. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, guess, you know, 19, 1950s onwards, I mean... I guess most people probably have some piece of synthetic thing that gets shoved to the back of a closet and you pull it out and yeah, it immediately yeah. shatters. Mm -hmm. and cracks, yeah. Is there yeah, any I mean, way, even, you is, know... If you really have something that is like a collectible type thing like that, that's not going to be worn, but let's say you had that from... Let's say you had those boots from new. How would you keep those around? Or is it just inherent in the material is going to slowly get it's inherent it is inherent it's going to happen at some point just because the plastics are not stable um certainly you know cold storage close you know yeah. um slows things down so um i mean a great example at the at, at, in detroit detroit has kind of like this fantastic and huge uh, puppet collection i think it's only second to like the the puppetry center in atlanta in in terms of its size um but I mean, it has kind of, you know, very important things like the original Howdy Doody and um, the first uh, made for TV Kermit. Um, and so Kermit is um, the museum had like long standing links with Jim Henson and there was mm -hmm. a big Muppet exhibition there. And he gave he gave the museum, you know, the first um, TV Kermit, the, the first first Kermit is in the Smithsonian that he made out of his mother's kind of green fur coat. Um, <laughs> but um, so Kermit is, is kind of filled with, he's sitting on a lily pad and he's kind of filled with polyurethane foam from like mm -hmm. 1950 something that is just kind of, you know, powder, completely degraded powder. And uh. it is sadly turning Kermit yellow uh rather than the green um so cold storage really would have helped slow that process down um and you know the curator is kind of like well can't we just kind of take all of this stuff out and it's like well no because it's kind of an integral 
you know, part of the object, it would be take, you know, like taking out, you know, all the understuff original understuffing from, you know, a, a Chippendale sofa or something. Yeah. It's like, you know, you, you really can't do that. So, um, you know, it is what it is. I mean, again, you know, he, this thing was an ephemeral object that was not made to last. And, um, you know, here he finds himself in a museum, uh, just slowly yeah, going. Up. That's so interesting to have to kind of resign certain objects to their fate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I bet that it's freaks like out fun. a lot of museum people. <laughs> It does, yeah. It's kind of fun though, as well. It's like, oh, well, it is what it is. I'm sorry. You know? Yeah, that's that's got to give them nightmares, at least. Yeah, if not more permanent yeah. issues. Um, so yeah, yeah. Synthetics sound awful to deal with. I mean, just absolutely terrible to deal with. Um, you said that some of the little uh, on this hat that some of those things were leather. Um. Now, I've seen absolutely horrifying pieces of leather recovered to just phenomenal shape. Um, is that likely, or did I just see a video of the one guy that, or the one time that guy was successful? Or, like, how do you deal with some of those more odd materials like leather? Um, well, yeah, it can be tricky. I mean, it really depends on what's happened to the leather. Um, so, I mean, you can do, you know, I treat, you know, leather fairly regularly, um, but it depends what's happened to it. So, I mean, if it's kind of, you know, it, it, if something has happened to the skin structure that has really kind of like changed, um, you know, if it's gotten kind of like very, very wet or very, very hot, mm -hmm. um, there's really no coming back from that. Um, but, you know, certainly most of the leather stuff that I deal with is kind of, uh, you know, uh, military, um, objects, mm -hmm. you know, uh, cartridge boxes, binocular coverings, things like that, uh, that, you know, kind of boots and things, um, when it's just kind of like, you know, the, the surface of the leather, you know, maybe it has kind of like some red rot or is, is kind of like breaking down. That you can treat really, really successfully. Oh, but cool. if something something kind of like, you know, catastrophic has happened, then um, there's there's less way there's less ways of kind of coming back from so that. So like the really heavy uh, cracking and stuff like that, you're probably not going to... Yeah. So if it looks like a dog chew, then, <laughs> you yeah, know, like a dry pig's ear or something, then no, you're not going to be able to uh, salvage that so much. So, yeah. Cool. Um, are there any other materials that are particularly difficult other than synthetics? And... Um, or is it pretty much just the new wave of horror? kind of like the new wave really that's it's kind of like um the main ones most of the other um you know natural materials you can kind of deal with um now I have you have kind of i have a question um are there any synthetic materials that are currently made that you would consider essentially archival um <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends. I mean, uh, you know, don't really know. That's the thing. I mean, they haven't been around that long. So that's true, yeah. You know, we really don't know what's going to happen in, you know, 100 years' time. So, um, you know, they're certainly getting a lot better. And it's kind of interesting that um, designers and artists are now kind of like much more aware about the materials that they use mm -hmm. and are much more concerned about um you know how long that their work is going to last for so um that's a good thing but you, you know you also have uh you know desirers like designers like uh you know iris van herpen um who's does so much stuff with kind of like 3d printing we have no clue. I mean, there's yeah. already pieces, you know, in, in like the Mets collection, like her skeleton dress where, you know, it, it's kind of, um, you know, bits break off or whatever. And she's like, well, I'll just print you a new one. And it's kind of like, well, which is the original then? And, yep. you know, so you have all those authenticity issues as well with stuff like that. Oh, so yeah. I can imagine that that's quite the problem.
Yeah, yeah. So, um, no, it's, you know, it's that, that whole thing is uh, absolutely is a whole new world of crazy. Yeah, sounds a little Wild right. West. Um, yes. Definitely. So definitely. while we're on the, uh, the difficulty or absurdity, um, what do you think is the most either advanced or absurd like technique that you guys use to do conservation? Like what's what would strike normal people as just crazy? uh well i i a lot of or is it all pretty much just some advanced version of some kind of fabric construction yeah i mean uh the one thing that people are always kind of like you know really interested in grossed out by is kind of split cleaning things is um, what now <laughs> split, <laughs> i know kind of using human saliva to clean um and uh and how do museum people lot. feel about that <laughs> Yeah, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it, it is what it is. I mean, from, you know, from anything, from paintings to ivory and all of that kind of stuff, it's used for, I use it a lot for kind of, you know, if you have like a Native American kind of beaded object for cleaning the little glass beads, human saliva is fantastic. So um, do you like, is there some guy like just making jars of saliva or are you just like, I know, putting it's it on gross. your finger? No, and... it's, it's, it's pretty much just you, hopefully. Uh, okay. <laughs> especially nowadays. Uh, <laughs> well, it gets frowned upon oh my God. at this point in time. Um, but generally, you kind of, you know, I mean, you don't want to kind of like have a hamburger before. I mean, you know. Yeah, I imagine that that could clean, be. Clean saliva. Um, I remember kind of, I. Uh, had a tour of the labs in Detroit with some students from uh, University of Michigan, and one of them was asking me. I think I was working on like a piece of birch bark, Native American something or other, and um, doing that. And he was like, "Could you use like dog saliva or something?" I was like, "Well, you could. I mean, I I could kind of like hold a bone in front of one of my dachshunds and get them to drool into a jar. I'm not sure oh, if that would be the same thing, but." <laughs> But once you do that, because obviously, I mean, it's good because of the enzymes that the saliva contains. Yeah. Um, you then go over there again with like ethanol to kind of denature anything nasty that's left behind. Well, and so, I assume uh, to keep it from to, from continuing to eat into the object. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you you know, you want to denature the whole thing. So um, yeah, for those folks yeah. at home, your saliva is really aggressive in a lot of ways. Don't put it on stuff you want to keep. Yes. <laughs> Especially not now, especially not now. No, um, yeah, no. But a big thing, a, a big trend, a big cleaning trend is, right now is using gels uh, for things um, to kind of uh, reduce stains and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, there's always, I mean, there's always just kind of like new techniques that are coming out, new chemicals. Um, so what's really uh, been the big change since, uh, I think you said you graduated in 99? Mm -hmm. um so it's 20 um, I years would say so what's the it is, yeah. what's what's the thing now that just was not the thing then i think we're kind of like moving more away uh more away from kind of like you know um full-on kind of like interventive treatments we do that a whole lot less i think we now wash things much less often um when um when when i was a student i mean you know when for the first part of my career we would wash things and we would use detergents and things like that i tend not to if i'm going to wash something now i'm probably just going to soak it in water mm -hmm. so that you don't have kind of extended you know rinsing periods and things like that um so i think it's just kind of um you know this this just like a little bit of less of everything. Kind so of it going. sounds from our previous definitions kind of a little closer to the conservation and a little further from the restoration. Yes. Okay. Yeah, cool. I think it's I think it's continuing to move away from there, ramping up kind of, you know, preventive conservation, so focusing more on kind of, you know, storage and the environment and things like that. Oh. Um and really, you know, a huge trend within within the um, you know field as a whole is it's kind of you know museums moving away from having on staff conservators to using um, you know contract staff um, as well. So uh, 
so you know you know departments that used to have kind of you know 40 people you know full time and now just have kind of like you know six people and then they bring in people for special projects and things like that so that's that's been a, a really big change yeah i can imagine yeah i feel like that's kind of a the big issue in a lot of the fields right now yeah yeah and i can't imagine that that is you know that this you know current pandemic situation is going to uh reverse that, that. No. i don't think it was accelerated yes you know <laughs> enormously actually so so yeah. i'm kind of um one thing i like to do uh, i like to talk about with these is kind of how people can get into this and textile conservation seems pretty far down a very particular narrow and windy path um but do you do do you do um do you do textiles for a hobby as well is this something that you've kind of done for fun um i mean no no um uh i mean obviously kind of you know i carried on uh you know weaving um after my you know bachelor's degree but i mean you know once once you start working and it's kind of like and you know certainly in, in private practice um you know uh it's like well you know people are paying me um you know to to work on their textiles rather than you know me creating my own so um yeah i haven't really done anything of my own for quite a long time but um maybe that'll change maybe i'll get back into that as uh <laughs> <laughs> now that everybody's got a little bit more time exactly yeah. exactly i mean i was fortunate with this whole situation that i had kind of like a huge backlog of projects that you know two months ago were keeping me awake at night and now i'm you know very happy that uh yeah i have to kind of carry on working so uh that's that's been a good thing oh, so good. we'll we'll see how uh we'll see how things you know pan out moving forward now what are some of the coolest things you've worked on? Um, I mean, it's always kind of cool when you work on, you know, costumes that are associated with kind of like particular people, you know, famous people. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, or and you know, I've had, I've had a lot of that, but um, it's always, I mean, it, I think kind of like the most interesting projects are the ones that present you with kind of like a problem um, that, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. this, this is kind of like going to be a good thing, a good meaty project that's going to be, you know, uh, has good problems to kind of solve. I mean, if you were just working on like the same sort of stuff all the time and it's kind of like, you know, a, a factory production line. Yeah, that's boring. <laughs> exactly. So it's, it's kind of nice having the variety and um, it's... Uh, yeah, it's good to have, you know, something that's a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, now, I think you really kind of dig your job now where you can kind of go and it sounds like you're going to all these places doing some really interesting, a really interesting mix of things. But what's like the holy grail? Like, what is that place? What is that? What is that gig? Or what is that object? Is there some object that you would just love to get in and work on that thing? I don't know that there is, to be honest with you. There's certainly not a place. I mean, okay, so there's no, there's that, not that some that museum. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, <laughs> what I really like now is kind of you know I I dip in and out of these museums, mm -hmm. and um, so you don't have to get involved in the politics that generally go along. Yeah. With. Um, Working in an institution filled with overqualified, underpaid people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know, that's fantastic. It's like, no, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have to spend my days in meetings. I just kind of, you know, get on with my stuff and enjoy, you know, the actual job, which is great. Um, um, and, um, and, and, you know, certainly, I mean, you know, early on in my career, absolutely, there was places that I, you know, totally would have loved to have worked and then um you know i was fortunate to kind of you know spend time in them and it's like no absolutely not i <laughs> this has killed any thought of uh doing that um yes but i mean certainly um 
you know, I mean, it would be fantastic to work on, you know, some more like the Royal Collections in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, I mean, you know, my, my undergraduate degree, um, you know, I was based at Hampton Court for three years. Um, but I mean, we didn't really work on um, uh, you know, costumes, kind of, you know, royal costume. It was more kind of like tapestries and things like that. Um, so, I mean, I think that would be really cool. And um, now that was part you know, of the National Trust thing that you were talking about earlier, correct? Mm -hmm. um, can you just just because I know that nobody here knows what the National Trust is. Can you explain what the National Trust is to the likely American so audience? The, yeah, so the National Trust is uh, actually, it's kind of like the UK's largest uh, charity organization. And um, they're also, I think, kind of like one of the largest landowners in the UK. And so you have kind of like these two separate parts that one is kind of like the environmental wing of the body. Um, and then the other is the heritage wing. So you have kind of, you know, large swathes of uh, just kind of like vacant you know wild land that the trust administers and then they also um have a collection of you know uh, i mean when i left back in 2005 i think they had like a somewhere between like 150 and 200 uh different um historic properties um and those are, you know, houses that uh, have been left to the nation, basically. Um, most of them came into being, they were donated in lieu of paying property taxes. Um, you know, which uh, on, you know, on a giant estate can be absolutely crippling, um, you know, to, to a family. Um, yeah. So... Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of you know I mean basically the world's largest museum body because of these houses. And so it kind of sounds like the uh, like the Smithsonian teamed up with the national parks. Exactly, okay, exactly, cool. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think that that's just an organization that nobody here really knows about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But chances are, I mean, if you if you're you know if you're in the UK and you're going on vacation, and you're going to kind of like you know. Um, to visit historic houses, chances are they're going to be owned by the National Trust. Part of okay, that, cool. Part of that. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then, last question before I let you go. Uh, okay. the Your favorite piece of textiles that you own? That I own. Um, Maybe top so... three. Was top three easier? Uh, no, no, there's definitely a one. Well, there's probably two, actually. Okay, two. So, um, so when I was in Philadelphia, um, as a Mellon Fellow, one of, the, one of the fantastic things about that program is that they give you money and time each year to, um, to go and travel and do research. And I didn't really do that much research, but I did travel. <laughs> um, so I think for the first year... Don't listen to them, so students. Don't listen. I know, do exactly. your research. So the first year, I I spent a month in Japan. Um, I think my second year, I spent a month in New Zealand, and then I went to uh, Guatemala and Honduras in my final year. And um, so when I was in, uh, I was you know pretty much in Kyoto and traveling around. And there's this fantastic. Um, tiny little natural indigo um, workshop um, in Kyoto called uh, Aizen Kobo. And um, I went out there, just kind of, you know, knocked on the door and uh, the little guy let me in who I, off the top of my head now, I completely forget his name. Um, but it was exactly as you can imagine. It probably hasn't changed since kind of, you know, the 1700s. Yeah. Amazing, immersive experience. And he just spent, pretty much the entire afternoon, um, you know, showing me stuff. And the v &A was actually uh, the Victorian Albert Museum in the UK. Um, was very interested in um, acquiring his collection eventually. So he was showing me all of these photos of people that I knew from the v &A kind of, you know, <laughs> visiting. Um, and then, you know, at the end of all of this, you know, you come to kind of like the little shop where you're kind of obliged to buy something. And, you know, at that point, I, you know, I was a melon fellow, not making a great deal of money. And um, so it's like, oh, crap, um, you know, now I've got to buy something, which was, you know, 
So he had these, you know, fantastic jackets and beautiful kind of like clothing. And it was like, you know, uh, very expensive through the roof. And, um, but he had this one panel that um, just kind of like a length of indigo fabric um, that his wife had, em had embroidered. And I was like, I love that. I can afford it. I'm going to buy that. And um, I've just loved that thing, you know, and I have it, you know, nicely mounted and framed now. And it's just, it's, that's probably kind of like my favorite piece because um, just because of that experience and, you know, the, the whole thing. And then um, back in 2014, uh, I went back to Kyoto and back uh, and his son was running the place now. But um, it was kind of nice. We, we had the same sort of experience. And um, at that point, I could, you know, afford to buy, you know, one of their jackets, which I did. And um, so that's probably my second favorite piece. So, um, awesome. But um, yeah, I mean, I get, you know, that that's that's definitely kind of like my favorite favorite thing. So that's so cool. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me this morning. I know we had some difficulties starting out, but we got there. Um, we did. We did. No, yeah, that was good. We made it. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much um, for joining me. I'll talk to you later. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Wyndham. Bye. Bye.